Welcome to Discovering. Grouse hunting is a popular sport here in the UP and improving their habitat can only make it better. We'll take a look at a habitat improvement project that drew some pretty big attention. This is another Pure Michigan event because it shows about what great volunteers are doing in our state. Then we watched as the 100 year old canoe was gradually brought back to life. Now it's time for it to make its maiden voyage. We put uh, several coats of paint and here it is, ready to hit the water. That's all tonight, so put your feet up. It's Monday night and time for discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. So today we're out here at the uh, Grouse Enhanced Management Trail, um, a little bit south of Gwynn. Uh, this is an area where grouse hunters can come, they know they have a place to go out and hunt. Uh, and what we're doing is helping to enhance the habitat. It's already got great habitat here uh, for grouse. We're gonna make that a little bit better by planting um, some crab apple trees, some oaks, um, and some nanny berries. So it gives them something to eat, a little bit more cover as well. Um, so when they come out here, when hunters are coming out here, they know that they're going into top quality habitat. This is part of our uh, MUCC's partnership with the DNR called the On the Ground Program. And this is a partnership that seeks to build a conservation community throughout Michigan through volunteer fish and wildlife habitat projects. We have about 20 volunteers out here, a lot of members of our board of directors, some folks from DU, some folks from uh, UP Whitetails, so both from the Lower Peninsula that drove up and a lot of people that came from right around the area. And they're all out here today uh, planting trees and shrubs. Um, this program is, is a pretty neat deal. It's actually a partnership also with Outdoor Life's Open Country Program. Um, we get funding from uh, multiple sources and grants, but it all goes to improving wildlife habitat in Michigan on the ground. A big part of this too comes from the Michigan DNR Wildlife Habitat Grants. So that's a grant program made out to uh, partner groups um, like ours, like other conservation groups that will go out there and do these projects. That's where the money for the trees comes from, for the equipment. And that's part of what's funded by the hunting and fishing licenses that we buy every time we go out into the field. So we always say that hunters and anglers pay for conservation. This is a living embodiment of exactly how they do that. And it's important to remember that as, as we have other issues come up where anti-hunters try to take away our rights. That's hunters and anglers licenses, as well as them coming out here physically to help out, um, that really benefits the wildlife that we all love. Well, we're out here today actually as part of the license package. As you recall, as we restructured our license package, our commitment was to put dollars on the ground, boots, in the, boots on the field, waders in the waters, and it's really improving habitat. So as we went across the Upper Peninsula, we actually put about $50,000 into deer range improvement. We put about $150,000 into habitat improvement. We put about $60,000 into aquatic improvement. So it really is about improving the habitat and making sure that those that hunt and fish are successful and have a high quality experience. So our gem site, um, as you come into it to find it, um, we will certainly have more maps and everything as, as this is coming and they will be posted on our website. But if you come down 557, and you take a right hand turn on the 438 and start heading west uh, you will see some signs right away that say hunter walking trails and our new gem signs are going to be going up with the picture of grouse will be going up there and we're this site here where we are today is just about three quarters of a mile north on the Perrin Brothers truck trail so that's kind of where we are today in this site <music>
Well, I started a program last year called Do Something Michigan. It's asking people to volunteer. It's a fabulous concept because we can help one another. Not only to working hard, let's give back to our communities, to our friends and neighbors. And this is a great illustration that we're doing right up here in the Upper Peninsula with doing this trail. It's part of the Grouse Enhancement Management System. And we're planting trees. MUCC is part of it, many other conservation groups, and it's a win for all Michiganders. So let's keep doing projects like this across Michigan. No, no water till you got your sixth tree dug. This is another Pure Michigan event because it shows about what great volunteers are doing in our state. So we have the MUCC, so many other conservation and wildlife groups coming together to make a better environment for all of us. So we're planting trees on the trail to really encourage more grouse and more natural activity to go on, and that's a win for everybody in Michigan. And it's really getting people involved to say, let's give back, let's work together, let's make stronger ties and be even better citizens. A deer group, um, ducks, all different kinds of organizations coming together out here to represent one another and to work together. So it's not about having separate trails, it's about how we share this great resource together and how we enhance it. Part of this program, the GEMS program, which is the Grouse Enhancement Management System, actually goes to local businesses and ask, ask them to help sponsor this. So they give discounts to people, they provide information, and we put them in our marketing then to talk about how they're helping do it. So it's a win not only for the environment, but for um, our economy. A couple pieces of legislation really helped make this happen. The new legislation on hunting and fishing gives us more resources to make better investments. And I think anyone that's a fisherman or a hunter really appreciates that. I do. I'm a fisherman. The other piece that really helped was some legislation I signed back in 2011 that allows for much more volunteer work to take place in terms of state assets and state resources. And that only made common sense to me. So we've made major improvements, but let's keep it up. Let's see action out here. So that's why it was fun to get a shovel and actually plant some trees. So this is just one of, of four that are, of gems that are being unveiled this year in the UP. Eventually there'll be actually 10 gem sites, so these gross enhancement management areas. So um, this is the, where we are today is just one of the trails. Eventually this gem site, which is one of the bigger ones in the UP here in South Marquette County, will have actually 900 walking trails, eight to nine trails, where we will be planting and mass producing trees. Um, we'll have clover put into the trails. These will be areas that are not only attractive to grouse hunters, but also attractive to um, deer hunters, bear hunters, um, bird watchers, snowshoers. So th these will be really a year round um, us usable sites. And the idea is that we are going to be rotating our aspen management through these areas so that we constantly have that prime age um, aspen coming online for that grouse um, and woodcock habitat. Um, so there'll be smaller cuts, a lot more cuts, and there'll be continued um, activity in these areas here for many years to come. Um, so improvements to the trails, the infrastructure, there will be an informative kiosk at the junction of Perrin Brothers Road and 438 which will have a map of the entire area. So every one of these gem sites is going to have that kind of infrastructure put into it. And not only that, that's where we're going to have all our partners um, emblems and signs up there that have been helping out on these gems. So their, their recognition will be there and we're hoping to bring in more um, of the business owners in Marquette County as well for advertisement um, because we're going to be attracting folks to these sites during the fall and other times of the year um, so we can get um, advertising going on and partnering with um, local businesses whether it's a gas stations and restaurants and those kinds of things so I think it's going to be an exciting thing and it's going to be an area where you can bring somebody that's maybe not used to hunting and come up and you're in prime habitat you've got a sign that tells you this is what you want to look for you're going to learn that kind of stuff and then you're going to be able to go out and take that knowledge and apply it other areas in the UP. So now you know what to look for uh, when you're out grouse hunting or woodcock hunting. So I, I think it's exciting times for the DNR and I think this is a, going to be a real benefit and an enhancement to hunting and, and recruiting hunt hunters um, for the future. You know we're doing, um, particularly in the, in the eastern upper peninsula, so they are really doing a lot of oak planting to try and get out in front of that beech bark disease. So we're losing a lot of that mass producing beech. Um, um, and so we are actually getting in there and getting oak trees in those replacement areas to kind of facilitate that recruitment of new mass producing trees. So we're using red oaks in a lot of those areas. Uh, we introduced in the Marquette area, we introduced um, a bunch of red oaks out to the Autrain wildlife area. Um, and so we will be inter there right now. There really isn't any natural oak in that area, so that'll be a boon for um, once they start producing acorns for bear and deer hunters. 
Um, and so that'll be a kind of an interesting site to, to visit as well. And it's really that site itself out at Autre and if you haven't visited, is a kind of a neat area because we have a lot of our open land species there. Um, it, there's also farm fields that are actually owned by the state where you can goose hunt as well. So it's a real attractive to the goose hunters. There is a refuge there, um, but right after that refuge um, is open, it's another big time for goose and duck hunters there on the basin as well. The next step out in, at this site is, is going to be finishing our gates up front, so these will be walk-in access only. Um, we are then going to disc and, and, and herbicide these areas and actually replant them with a gr rough grouse clover mix. So this, these, all these areas will be planted in with clover, which again will be attracting wildlife, all kinds of wildlife to these trails. Um, and so that, like I said, this, is, this whole area is gonna be just a real prime spot for grouse hunting. was a warm, rainy morning. A group of us were gathered on the shores of Teal Lake in anticipation. Among the anxious onlookers were Cliff and Midge Waters, the previous owners of the canoe. I'm sure Craig has been picturing this day since this saga began a year ago. When I got it, um, we had it home for about a week and um, a friend and I brought it up here to Teal Lake, the same place, and we put it in the water. Um, wanted, to, wanted to float it. Once I got it off the water and back home, ripped the canvas off of it and started um, taking the, the parts of the ribs off that were broken and then um, um, started stripping it. And then uh, took it over to Dave Osborne's uh, place and we put new ribs in it and some new planking. We first saw this 100-year-old canoe back in May, sitting on a set of horses in a garage. We've spent the winter pretty much getting it to where it's at now someplace between 1905 and probably about 1908 is when it was made. We saw it again in June when it took on a new coat of varnish. It has a, a, a richness to the finish when you see that the wood grain is completely filled up. Then again in July when it acquired a fresh new skin of canvas along with some color. We brought it back and uh, sanded it and sanded it and sanded it and put uh, filler on it and then we put uh, the primer on it and then several coats of paint and and here it is ready to hit the water well i bought it i think in 1940 in the summer of 49 and I'm <clears throat> at the time I, I was a assistant scoutmaster and I used to take the boys out on it some of overnight trips different lakes around the UP I wonder if any of my old boy scouts ever remember them um, I've been in love with that thing since I had it and my shoulders are shot and I can't paddle anymore so I sold it to a guy that would really take care of it and he really fixed it up. Been hanging in my garage for 30, 30 years or more. But uh, I enjoyed every minute of it, duck hunting, fishing and just plain traveling. Different rivers, Fence Lake, which you can't get into anymore. The Boy Scout troop spent the nights up there. One night we were paddling in the dark on a fence lake and a beaver slapped his tail right alongside it. <laughs> the paddles went flying and everything. We thought we were going to sink. <laughs> uh, the Carp River out north of Nagani Many lakes that uh, I can't even remember some of them. Uh, um, lake Lavasser, it wasn't called then, it was called Mud Lake then. It's been on Deer Lake many times, Teal Lake many times. Cabogam, where my cottage is, is 
many, many, many trips there, all over the place. I had it up in Canada, but we didn't need it. But if we needed it, it was there. Uh, for fish, a lot of ducks. Used to duck hunt on the carp out north of Ishpermington and north of Nagani and shot a lot of ducks out there. Oh, it's, it's wonderful to see it there and it's, it's in much better shape and looks pretty good. Uh, but uh, I didn't enter the life of the canoe until I got married to Kip 60 years ago. And then when we had the kids, we used it quite a lot on the lake and uh, even when he wasn't there. And uh, I would take the kids out on the lake. It was such a steady, sturdy canoe. It, uh, it, it was easy to handle, untippable. I was, uh, we really felt safe in it. And uh, I remember one time we went out on Kobagum and it was fairly calm in our little corner. And I got a little further past a point and I found out, uh oh, there are big waves coming at me. And I didn't dare turn around and go broadside to the waves. So I went to the far side of the lake and it went all the way around the edge where it was safe and did my arms get tired that time. But we sang along the way and made it fun and the kids didn't get scared. I was scared. <laughs> and then we picked, we picked cranberries from it because there were some cranberry patches in our, down by our dock. And uh, we, we've just had a lot of fun with it. Well, it was gray, and then I painted it green, and I like it green better than red. <laughs> but Mr. Kitchen will take good care of it, I know that. When I, when I got the canoe, um, Midge was there and um, such a big help in, in, in giving me information about the boat. She loves to tell stories about the boat and uh, it was obvious that she's real proud of the boat. And so as I was working on the boat, I thought, you yeah, know, Midge, that's a, a real fitting name for the boat. I remember the first night that uh, the, the discovering program was aired, I had not been able to get a hold of the waters to tell them that it was going to be on. And um, so I called their home and Midge answered the phone and she was all excited because she had seen the program. And it turns out that one of her children was there and saw the program too and was real excited about the whole thing. So it's been almost like it's, it's come full circle. It's, you know, the, the boat and being handed over to somebody else and now it's back on the water and hopefully at some point even they can get to enjoy it. Um, to be able to take them out and, and show them the boat and, and take them out for paddles and stuff like that. When, when you paddle the boat, you look into it and all of the wood is there and um, you know, there's the ribs and there's the planking and there's the, the, the thwarts and the seats and everything and all of the boats, the parts seem to fit and they have a, a place and the other part of it is when the boat needs to be repaired, it comes off and you put new pieces on there. And that way the boat is, is been, it's made to be used and fixed when something gets messed up on it. You know, as I think about paddling the canoe and I think about uh, the history of it, uh, the waters having it and the people that were before that and I know some of the history from the waters of the fishing and the moose trips and the, the family outings and stuff and you know I just wonder about how it's going to compare with uh, the next 30 years that we have it compared to where it's already been. It's been used a lot um, and it's just neat to think about uh, where it's been and the things that people have done with it and, and, and just you know, it's a hundred and some years old and the history behind it, it's just, it's incredible to think that now uh, I've got the thing and the next leg of its life, um, if you think about it that way. And hopefully the, the canoe will continue to be a, a good boat for, for many, many years. I think to people like Craig, Cliff and so many others, boats like this old canoe become almost alive. They develop their own personality their own traits and characteristics. 
Use it enough and you get to know your boat like a good friend. <clears throat> I've been in love with that thing since I had it and my shoulders are gone and I can't paddle anymore, otherwise he would have never got it. <laughs> After following Craig through the restoration process over the last year, and now talking with Cliff and Midge about the times they've shared with this old canoe, it's not hard to imagine what she might say or the memories she might have. There were a lot of good times up and down the lake, just roaming around and visiting with neighbors from the lakeside. I'm sure this old gal would remember Cliff and all the lakes they've seen together. The fish they've caught, the portages they've crossed. I'm sure she'd remember that beaver or the many Cub Scouts who learned about the water and the wilderness while skimming across some UP lake sitting on her seats. I'm sure she'd remember Midge, her namesake, and that day in the wind. Or the kids, who I'm sure have a wealth of wonderful stories and tales they could tell about days spent riding along with Mom and Dad. My nickname is Midge, and uh, I had no idea that he was planning to name it that, but I'm certainly honored. <laughs> a lot of good memories, a lot of good times, and uh, I'm glad it's got a good home. She'd also remember days long before any of our time. Back a hundred years ago when some canoe maker somewhere shaped her out of a pile of wood and canvas. Unaware of the memories and stories that would come out of her existence. Unaware of the friends she'd make along the way. The places she'd see or where she'd end up. I'm guessing the thought never crossed his mind a hundred years ago that someday a handful of people would be standing along the shore of a lake staring in complete awe and admiration at the work of art he so casually created. Now restored back to her young self and ready to meet the water once again and push on for yet another hundred years. I wonder how many more unforgettable adventures will exist simply because of this canoe that somebody somewhere built a hundred years ago. And I wonder, in another hundred years, who will be standing along some lake somewhere in complete awe and admiration and telling stories of the times they've had and the things they've seen because of this 200-year-old canoe.